All right, going to continue working through booster box number two of sorcery. So these will be from the center column of my second booster box. Yeah. Alright, got an oasis in here, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I have a fire water yet, so yeah, excited to be seeing that. Uh, the elite in this pack is Stone Gaze Gorgons, so uh, 5 mana, 3 power, other minions at rest at adjacent locations are disabled. Um, I guess at rest means that they're not currently moving, so they don't, you know, interrupt something while it's doing something. I'm not sure how this would interact with a card like uh, Grapple Shot. Like, does it finish its grapple and hit? Not sure. But in general, this, uh, you know, this card kind of locks down a lot of other minions. Um, it's you know, kind of like an ongoing control effect. I think it's decent. You know, I think it's easy to kill. Um, you know, three power doesn't have burrow or submerge, so um, whatever it's doing is temporary. But it's a big area of effect. So um, yeah, I think it's probably great and limited and. Uh, you know, it could be a role player and constructed. Mm, I've, I've never put it in a constructed deck, so I think just the fragility of creatures means that this isn't exactly the way I'd like to go about uh, controlling other people's minions. Uh, but it's also kind of a, a must answer card in that. Um, you know, everything else is disabled, so like if they don't have an answer for it, it just gets to operate unchecked. So um, maybe could be good. Uh, probably not what I'm going to be playing in Constructed, but um, I don't know, there's maybe a home for it. Hmm. Requires experimentation and assessment of metagame, I think is the ultimate answer there. Uh, ooh, all right. So we've got a foil here. It's a foil undertow, and um, yeah, I'm a big fan of all these water effects that um, move things, you know, around in the water. So this one says, uh, Genesis, staying within this body of water, move target unit one step. So it has a really far reach anywhere in the body of water, and um, you know this can like trigger a, a giant shark or um, you know if you flood a bottomless pit, uh, drag them into a bottomless pit. Um, I'm sure there's other other options that are also interesting. It's also like just great for repositioning something so that if you're going to play some area of effect, drown effect, like there's some merge effect that are within the effect, um, or making extra movement for your avatar or some other uh, minion that you have. So yeah, I think it's a really, really nice card. And I guess, is it true? Yeah, I guess they're all just full art on the back side, which I think is interesting. Um, I guess one thing that would be tempting to do is, uh, yeah, I guess if I foil out a deck, I could just play with uh, the full art sides. Um, maybe that's not kind. And then maybe the, the foil side is actually so cool that the full art side is not where it's at. But um, I, love that they, I love that they put the full arts on the back side. Since you know, people mostly play sleeves, it's not like cards might be useful that way. Okay, so uh, this pack, the uh, elite card is 
rest in peace. Uh, five mana, it's an aura. Whenever a spirit or undead minion occupies affected land sites, burrow it. So, um, you know, there are a bunch of earth creatures that um, recur themselves. And we've been talking about things like phantom ship being a way of recurring spirits. So this is, um, you know, like a metagame lever. If these become really popular and um, are dominating the metagame, this is a card that handles that. Um, if there are sideboards, this is like a classic sideboard card. Um, but I think since most people, you know, just play games without sideboards, um, and there's no, like, tutor aside from Dream Quest that can find this, right? There's no, like, aura tutor yet, but I imagine at some point there will be. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to find space for this in a deck. Um, so, you know, I think this could have, like, value later in time, depending on what the metagame is or, like, what the general rules of how sorcery are played are. Uh, okay, and then we got another another foil in this pack. It's a cornerstone. Uh, like I said in an earlier video, um, I don't foresee cornerstone getting a lot of play, but um, you know, until something happens in the future that makes cornerstone really good. Um, I guess maybe cornerstone might be good with like wayfaring pilgrim. Because right, it draws a card if it's for each, uh, you know, corner it visits. And right now, the only way, you know, there are a couple ways, but this would be a way of getting the cornerstone play turn two and, like, drawing that card on turn two. But the way Faring Pilgrim could, like, start walking even earlier. Uh, so maybe it's, like, a little interesting. So it's a corner case. Ah! Forgive me, I'm a dad. Um, okay. So the elite in the next pack is Undertaker Engine. This is a seven mana, four power. Uh, at the end of your turn, you may burrow and unburrow any combination of artifacts and minions at the site. So. This card is actually pretty interesting to me. Um, you know, I think I've talked in a previous video about how much time it takes to burrow things or unburrow them. Um, this one's nice because you can burrow opposing minions or artifacts, um, and that will, you know, for the most part, kill them if they don't have burrowing themselves. Uh, if there are buried treasures, it can, you know, unburrow them and open them, um, kind of effortlessly. And, um, you know, in the world in which I expect creatures to be just killed, um, this kills something when it comes into play, or multiple things. Um, and it also, you know, it has uh, four toughness. Their power, so um, you know there there are a bunch of like removal effects and creatures that won't kill it, so it it can take a little bit more work uh, to handle it. So um, seven's a lot. It's really expensive. It's hard to compete with other things that cost seven, but I could see in the right deck where um, this might be you know the tool that you wanted. Um, yeah, probably some kind of like rampy deck. Like if you like, is it like Death Dealer, which just kills every minion when it comes into play and has four power? Like maybe you like an Undertaker engine. Um, you know, if you, especially if you want to like kill specific creatures and not all creatures, you know, like Undertaker, Undertaker engine might be the ticket for you. Um, imagine that, like, you're probably a pretty rampy deck if you're playing Undertaker Engine, so maybe it's going to go better in Earth than other things. 
Um, so yeah, I think like interesting card and um, yeah, as I see more things that reward or yeah, I mean mostly reward burrowing or are punished by burrowing, um, I'll keep thinking about it. Um, oh, another foil. All right. This box, this, this column has been kind of hot on the foils. So this is a York Crossbowman foil. Uh, yeah, love the way I, this looks. Um, yeah, just really like these like classic medieval illustrations. Um, you know, three power, three mana. Uh, would be pedestrian, but like ranged is a great ability. Like it can beat other things with similar stats. Um, and, you know, it's in Earth, and Earth is the place where, you know, there are cards like Vantage Point, which, uh, or High Ground, I think, which give, like, plus one range to ranged things. So, um, you know, it's kind of in, in the right place in terms of um, element. And, yeah, I think there are ways of, like, powering this up that create lopsided effects and takes new range from range strikes, takes new damage from range strikes is, uh, I think also very interesting. Like, um, if there's ever a metagame with where like ranged is a thing, um, I think being immune to damages of that type is pretty powerful. So this is like a potentially like very cool card and, um, yeah, I think it's also very pretty. So. This one I would tend to hang on to. Alright. Next pack. Um, got some cards we've seen before. And, uh, alright, so the this is a unique. This is, I think, a really good one. Uh, four mana, four power. Uh, Airborne, so just like a great stat block. Like for me, this is kind of like a dreamy stat block. Like I, I like four mana, four power a lot because it's it's just past that critical three that I talk about all the time. And then it has airborne, so it's hard for other things to gang up on it without you opting in. Uh, it's mobile, all oh, that's great. Uh, if it didn't have any more text, you know, I probably think real hard about playing it, but it also has, whenever a weaker allied minion here is attacked, you may return it to his owner's hand. So, um, yeah, obviously your opponent is unlikely to play into attacking things here that would let you, you know, have cool combos, like, um, Uh, blanking, um, like if you have a thing with a good genesis effect and then they attack it, you get to like take your guy back and then get the cool genesis effect again. But also, um, you know, like your opponent can't just choose not to attack you ever. So if you're able to, you know, keep this on the board and the game is mostly about combat, um, you might get lots of opportunities to um, block something and then return it to your hand and like recur a Genesis effect. Uh, so I think that this could be a, a moderate source of card advantage in the right conditions. Um, I think probably this is like ridiculously annoying and limited, but even you know constructed. Um, I think this can do some work, so uh, I think it, it is a card I will uh, try to build in decks and see, you know, how it, how it pans out. Um, what else? Wow, another pack with a foil. How nice. Okay. Um, this is the Unland Eel. And... Um, I'm not even sure we've seen a regular version of this yet. So, two mana, two power. 
uh, submerge. Whenever Unland Eel submerges, it may drag another minion down with it. So, um, you know, if there's ever a thing that I wanted to give charge that didn't have it, it would be this, because I could cast this eel and then get charged somehow and submerge and drag down um, an opposing minion. Like, how exciting. Uh, but it also... Um, you could submerge your own guys with it. So, um, you know, if for some reason you had something that benefited from submerging but had to surface to, like, attack, like, a giant shark, um, you know, this could be used to kind of, like, help protect the other thing by, you know, submerging it. Um, and also, it could be that you, you know, you play this somewhere that um, is, like, out of range of combat and... Um, you know, play a card like Riptide to drag something over to it and then and then submerge and you kind of get to drown um, some other creature because of that. So, um, yeah, like, I don't mind this card. I think that water has lots of tricks that move things around and uh, where I do you think uh, there's a lot of removal in the game, um, I think people aren't always going to aim it at something that's like small like this. And I like the text, right? It whelms the unwary. And I think that um, yeah, catching someone off guard is the way that this is going to really pay out. So, like, interesting. Um, Alright, next pack. Uh, all right, so the elite is, or it's actually, it's a unique, it's a Grim Reaper, two mana, one power, but lethal, so great for fighting other minions, and it's whenever Grim Reaper kills a minion, banish that minion and all copies, search its owner's cemetery hand and spellbook, and banish any copies they shuffle. So, um... You know, first of all, we've talked about there are a bunch of ways of recurring spirits, so, like, this can be gotten back. Um, it's in air, so something like Dream Quest can go find it. And, um, you know, often with cards people like, they play them in multiples. So this killing something could be a minor source of card advantage because, like, they do have some in their hand. Or they could be playing something like Death Speaker, where they're planning to recur it and getting it out of someone's cemetery is limiting their options. Um, or just sometimes like people don't have that many threats because most of their deck is answers, and so um, getting rid of multiple copies of like their key threats um, could kind of disassemble the general power level of their deck. So I think this card is very strong, and um, when I think about building a spirits deck, uh, this feels like a key component. And um, I think that it's also just like a decent value card. Um, you know, I think that I like inexpensive creatures with lethal, and this one feels like it has some additional upside. Um, also, with Evil Presence, it could have charge, so you could just catch people off guard with it. I mean, they'll see the Evil Presence and be a little suspicious, but um, you, know, you can't just like not go into the Evil Presence. Sometimes, sometimes you gotta get in there and take a risk. Uh, this column of boosters continues to deliver on the foil front. So we got a Clamor of Harpies. Um, Four mana, three power, airborne, genesis, teleport target weaker minion to this location, Clam of Harpies may strike it. Uh, so in magic there's a creature called Flame Tongue Kavu, which you know, is like a four two and when it enters play, I think deals four damage to another creature, maybe any target. Um, it's like just always a two for one and 
Vermont Harpies feels like it's in a similar neighborhood. Um, you know, almost, almost, I mean, I guess you could only drag things that have one or two power because it has to be weaker than it. But, um, you know, there's a fair chunk of weaker things. Yeah, you know, I was watching a game where uh, someone summoned a bunch of frogs and the frogs had a panoptic manuscript and, um, you know, har harpies like yanking the frog over and, um, you know, killing it would be amazing. Um, I guess the frogs were submerged, so this wouldn't be able to like pull the submerged thing out. Uh, but, uh, alright, so even though that example is not real, like, um, you know, killing someone else's, like, Wayfaring Pilgrim, for example, would be a, to like, a thing this could do that would be very powerful in a, a card that's totally in the metagame. So, I think there are just, like, enough utility cards that have one or two power that, um, I think playing these Harpies, they're, they're always going to get a little bit of value, and having a, you know, three power for four mana isn't the worst either. So, yeah, I think this is nice and situationally a constructed card. Alright, I'll move these cards over. Make space for some more. Okay. Uh, I hope this foil train continues. Choo choo! Yeah. So look at that from a nap, so I'm a little on the uh, silly, silly side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Headless Haunt. I don't think we've talked about this one yet. Uh, so three mana, four power. Uh, void Walk. At the start of your turn, Headless Haunt teleports to the top of a random site or void. So, um, there are 20 spaces in Sorcery, basically you roll a d20 to see where this thing goes. Um, if you don't have a way to control where it's randomly going, I think this card is really not good. Um, even though I love the 4 power for 3 mana, um, you know, just appearing random spots is not where it's at in my book. Um, so, uh, you know, there are a few artifacts that let you either roll random things twice or choose a random thing. I still don't think there's, like, enough of those effects in the game. Notably, the princess can search for the one that lets you choose, so, you know, you have a couple tutoring options. Maybe, maybe you could you know, control these random effects enough that it's good. Um, but I think there's not quite enough things that are random yet, and I don't think their payoffs are high enough that um, it's kind of worth the hassle of making this work. So, um, yeah, I think this is a... Uh, maybe one day this will be great, but not yet. Um, wind Slith. So... Two mana, uh, one power, airborne, air spellcaster, and after it casts a magic spell, can push a unit here one step. Um, in general, you know, this is very fragile, and. But, like, the fact that it can push things is interesting. She can only push things on her own space, which is less interesting. But, like, free movement is good, and... Um, you know, like, the, the amoeba that spreads over the board is, you know, my, like, go-to. This is a cool use of free movement, but... Um, yeah, I think it's also the case that if you summon things in your own spaces and she's kind of like in a forward position and then, you know, the next turn you really want your thing to move two spaces, but like she casts a spell and push it one space so that like it can move two spaces, like maybe she could be like a recurring source of like extra movement and maybe that is good enough. I think this is a like... 
I have to play with it more before I can feel really confident that it is trash or treasure. Um, you know, that said, I think that any deck that it's good in is probably pretty aggressive. Um, you know, if I have a lot of mana and I'm playing a long game, this is just like underpowered. So it's really like if I'm playing a deck that has a short game and I need to get my creatures exactly where I want to go, um, you know, quickly enough, this is this is probably more where this thing's at. And also, you know, in a shorter game, people have less time to draw their removal effects and they'll prioritize their removal on higher impact things. And so, you know, they might let this one power thing just hang out by. Um, you know, when I think about alternatives, when I can pay like two mana for three power or you know, two mana for two power and some more like proactive ability, um, that's kind of where my intuition is that I want to be spending my mana and cards. Um, Mordic Druids. Okay, I'm excited to read this one. Uh, two mana, one power, spellcaster. Whenever you lose life due to an undefended attack nearby, the attacker's controller also loses that much life. Okay, so, um, this creates symmetric life loss when your sites are being attacked, so it kind of helps protect a whole cluster of sites. It doesn't actually stop attacks from them, and it really makes it, like, if your opponent, if you're not pressuring your opponent's life total, this is irrelevant. It's only the world in which, like, you're also threatening your opponent's life total where this card helps you race, and, you know, I think in Earth, for two mana, you could have three power. So, like the question is, is this helping you race enough? Um, it's also like very easy to kill. So, um, like a lot of very aggressive decks are probably playing things like Firebolt and Fireball and Cone of Fire, where like killing this incidentally is going to be pretty easy. So, I don't love this, like, I think, like, they can just kind of kill it if it really matters, and it takes a lot of work for it to matter, and as far as spellcasters go, I mean, Earth is kind of hurting for good spellcasters, but Earth also currently doesn't need spellcasters, so I think this card is, like, a pass for me. Um... Right, what else do we have? Nothing shiny, so I guess you can't can't get a foil in every pack. Um, or if you could, people wouldn't want them as much, so it's good that you can. Uh, next pack we have. Oh, all right. The, uh, the rare slot is an elementalist. So, um, you know, this is an avatar whose secret sauce is that they have an additional uh, threshold from each color. Uh, obviously, this leans into playing four color, you know, four element decks where you get to cherry pick the, the best of each element. Um, so my take on this is it's not too hard to build a mana base that supports three colors um, pretty well. Like, I think you can get, um, you know, close to like 10-ish of each element threshold on 20 cards. And that's like within my comfort zone for playing cards that have double threshold requirements. So I think, and you know, I think there's powerful enough cards in each element 
that I'm not sure that my power level goes up a lot by you know cutting some cards and adding a fourth element. Um, I also think that the most powerful cards are kind of concentrated in air and fire right now. Um, not to say that there aren't very good cards in earth and water, but um, you know it's just you know what I currently see. Um, and a lot of the best water cards want to be in a kind of dedicated dedicated water strategy. So I think ways that this could be cool is if you are playing a dedicated water strategy and then the elementalist was just letting you splash cards that were out of water, uh, which would be interesting. Um, I think that over time as the as they print more powerful cards in different elements, uh, it could be the case that getting to play all four elements really reliably would matter. Um, also, if they print more cards that have higher threshold requirements so that they're not so easy to splash, and I think in general the threshold requirements are pretty low right now outside of um, you know things like the water site that requires eight water threshold to turn into a creature like um, e even like three threshold is not that hard to get into um, you know I think all those circumstances could make the elementalist really good um, I also think that if uh, some like inexpensive cards uh, started having more demanding threshold requirements. And I think this is already a little bit true. Like I think that there are some two and three mana cards that require two threshold and you know, m maybe to be able to make those work, um, you could like, you know, playing an elementalist might make sense. Uh, or if maybe over time, a critical mass of no threshold cards, like sites, that were just like very strong were made, playing the elementalist so that your sights could be generally like much stronger um, seems like a possibility. So I think um, I think that this card isn't ready to shine, um, but depending on like what future card sets are printed, um, you know I think there's a, a high ceiling for how good this card could become. So I guess it's a uh, you know collect it, store it, and, you know, the, the day where it hits that threshold is the day where you, like, trade them away or sell them or whatever. Um, okay. Next pack. Uh, great. So, um... The elite here is Raytonus Titan. Um, seven mana, six power, Genesis, strike each enemy here. Uh, I love this card. I um, kind of, uh, I've built quite a few ramp decks around like Pathfinder and Earth cards and cores and Philosopher's Stones um, to get to like, you know, high amounts of mana pretty quickly, and um, especially if your opponent is being pretty aggressive, you can be on the back foot. So this thing, the fact that it comes in and has an immediate impact on the board, like this is a pretty powerful removal spell, um, and then leaves behind a huge body. Um, I think this card's just great, and it's exactly what a kind of rampy earth deck wants, and um, yeah. A plus would recommend. Um, Alright, uh, nothing else in this pack that is shiny. So, on to the next one. And. Okay. Uh, we have the elite here is Meteor Shower. 
I'm like, just to the point of talking about threshold, right? This costs nine and requires three fire thresholds. So it requires that only a third of your threshold be fire. So even though three seems like a fire threshold, like a lot of fire threshold for a card that's this expensive, you can easily play this in a three color deck and you know, cast it no problem by the time you hit turn nine. Um, and so, you know, kind of that's my point about Elementalist is just the relative amount of threshold icons to cost isn't high enough in a lot of cases to warrant playing an Elementalist. Um, you know, like, if I wanted, like, if I were a designer and I really wanted Meteor Shower to be a, like, you have to be heavily committed to fire to play this card, you know, I'd put, like, five or six fire elements on here. Then, you know, people would have to really work to make this, you know, a fire card. Okay. Uh, anyway. So, this card lets you drop three meteors uh, that are... Um, you know, di different size explosions. Uh, one of them is major explosion, one of them is minor explosion, and um, I think one of them is the old template for Fireball. Fireball used to hit things outside of its space. Now it only hits within its space, but um, yeah, there's like a little Easter egg to the design here. Um, and they can't share borders, so you can't um, you can't like overlap the damage much or at all. I think maybe at all. Um, but like, yeah, p powerful fire magic. In general, nine is like just ridiculously expensive and major explosion at seven is usually sufficient. So I think that this is um, probably not a great card. Like if you're playing fire, you're probably managing like crowd controlling creatures with less expensive spells so hitting multiple locations isn't as exciting as it looks and i think this card is probably just too slow to play and where it's possible with like mixes or other ramp things that paying to bring out a big creature is worth it because it can have a game dominating effect because the meteor shower just kind of has a one-time effect it's less of a good thing to ramp out um, so, actually, like, not that excited about this card. I would definitely trade it for other things that I thought were more useful. Okay. Alright, next pack. Uh, the Elite here is uh, Chains of Prometheus. I'm trying to get a whole card in there. There we go. Whenever a player draws a card, that player taps their strongest untapped minion. So this is a symmetrical effect. Like, it affects you to you as well. And the more cards a player draws in a turn, the worse it is for them. So, you know, this is a card that's really good for controlling decks. Like, decks that aren't planning on winning with creatures and are planning on doing something else. Um, or, yeah, it's not even, like, great for decks with, like, swarms because, like, unless all the creatures have, like, relatively similar power, I guess maybe, like, a swarm of soldiers or, like, you know, undead. I think maybe the Earth player doesn't care. They don't draw that many cards a turn. And it's only, you know... So, and like, they just have a bunch of small creatures and tapping any particular one of them isn't a big deal. So, um, I've seen this in some deck lists from Gen Con. Uh, seems playable. Um, and certainly if you're a control deck, like, not having to kill every creature, but like, you know, this is always going to tap at least one of their creatures, and if they summon something really big that somehow is protected from your other removal, like, this will take care of it. So I think this is, like, a really high utility card. And just the question is, like, what is the non-creature victory condition that goes with it? Um, 
And honestly, it could also go really well with like fire and lightning decks where um, because it keeps tapping your opponent's creature, it, it lets you kind of find time to cast the fire and lightning more efficiency, efficiently. Yeah, I think this card is actually quite good. Like, I think it's good in the current metagame, and I think it's good in future metagames. So, yeah, I think, I think this is a nice one. Uh, no foils in that pack, so moving on to the next one. I guess I should uh, move these cards so that the uh, camera can see everything. Okay. Opening up this pack. Uh, got a duplicate elementalist. So, um, you know, probably want to try and trade that for a Pathfinder if I can. Because I don't have a Pathfinder yet, and Pathfinder is my favorite. Uh, no, no other foils. Uh, next pack of the column. Hmm. Okay, what do we got? Uh, another Raytonis Titan. So, um, yeah. Boom, I have my play set of those, which I'm very excited to have and look forward to having them. Come and play and stomp all kinds of creatures to death. <laughs> a little morbid, but yeah, that's a sorcerer's deal. Alright, and then the last pack for this column. I got a poison dagger, phantasmal shade, and um, right, I got my second copy of uh, Chains of Prometheus. So when I figure out how my control deck is winning, or um, when I build a fire and lightning deck as I inevitably will, um, I, have, I have the cards I need. So uh, that's it. That's that's the column. And uh, pat on the back. I did it in 42 minutes, so getting faster. Uh, thanks. Hope you enjoyed this too. Uh, you know, uh, like, subscribe. I guess I'm making a bunch of sorcery content because um, opening this booster box is fun and it's kind of jazzed me about the game again. So, okay. See you later.